Today is part three in our four-part series on the history of Mercedes. And let me tell you guys, this week it gets real. We usher Mercedes into the post-war modern era. We're talking gold wings. Gull wings, baby. We're talking what? SL uh, convertibles, not gull wings. You know, we're seeing Mercedes become a sophisticated and fast brand that we know today. And it's all led by a guy named Rudy. Yeah. That's today on Pass Gas. Let's get into it. On May 5th, 1952, the Mercedes factory racing team arrived at the Mille Miglia. They were there to start in their first international race since the 1939 Swiss Grand Prix. Still recovering from the brutality of World War II, Mercedes had heads their bets for financial recovery on one man, Rudolf Uhlenhaut. With only a small budget and 20-year-old designs to build on, Uhlenhaut somehow managed to bring the team into the present. He created a car instantly recognizable to any enthusiast today, a rounded, low-slung silver body, a large grille adorned with the Mercedes star, and doors that looked like the wings of a goal. The car finished second before going on a dominant run for the rest of the season, bringing excitement and credibility to a brand that just seven years earlier had been effectively declared dead. How did Mercedes return to prominence just a decade after the war? How did Rudolf Uhlenhaut create the world's first supercar using only parts from the Mercedes parts bin? And how did he shape Mercedes into the brand we know today? Well, today on Pass Gas, it's part three of our four-part history of Mercedes. Welcome to Pass Gas, everybody. My name is Nolan Sykes. I'm joined, as always, still playing with that screwdriver across from me. It's James Pump. I've What's been up? playing with this screwdriver all week. I started, <laughs> yeah, I started last week when we were recording the last episode, and I'm still playing with it. I like playing with screwdrivers because it's like a knife that it's harder to cut yourself with. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Joe Weber, how you doing? What's up? I'm truly fired up to be here <laughs> joe is of course drinking his signature roast coffee yeah. which is available at all dillard's locations <laughs> yeah just go to any coffee store and ask for a cup of joe yeah hey, hey you'll whoa. get it yeah do you get a piece of that every time yeah, joe gets yes. 50 cents for every cup of joe so I mean, wouldn't that be amazing wouldn't oh, it god be? no well at least 100 cups drink a day around the world that's pretty good Pretty good. You think only a hundred cups of coffee are drink? Well, no, they have to specifically ask, ask for a, a cup, cup of, of Joe. Joe. Yeah. 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 So then this is much smaller. I bet it's a thousand. Thousands. But it's thousands. I bet there's so many boomers who call yeah. it. Hey, I'll have a cup of Joe. Yeah. Nice cup of Joe. I get uh fifteen cents every time somebody uses the word commode. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my every family. Time... My great great grandfather commode pumphrey. <laughs> <laughs> invented the terminology not the apparatus yeah. but the terminology marketing he was a marketing man so every time someone plays bulls on parade you get a piece of that mm -hmm. nice. take That's the cool. mic over the commode mm -hmm. the show is shot show it <laughs> i was reminded last episode that diesel was a guy's last name vin diesel no but before vin diesel <laughs> yeah. his great great grandfather <laughs> yeah. Yeah. uh invented diesel and yeah. patented it. Created one of the coolest last names on earth. Yeah. Diesel. Because of it. Diesel. Jack Diesel. Jack Diesel. Jack Diesel. Diesel. Diesel jeans. Diesel yeah. jeans. All right. When the war broke out in Europe on September 1st, 1939, Mercedes shifted to wartime production practically overnight. The Nazi purge of much of Mercedes' leadership and subsequent installation of party leaders like Jacob Verlin had been leading to this moment. Managers who resisted the Third Reich were tried, sentenced, and executed, and those with Jewish relatives had been forced out. Arguably, Mercedes' most important contribution to the war effort was a turbocharged, fuel-injected V-12 aircraft engine Whoa. that was used in most of the Luftwaffe's planes. Mercedes also built a variety of vehicles for the German war machine, including G-4 half-tracks, the Wehrmacht Kubelwagen, a sort of German Jeep, and the L-1500 troop transport. Mercedes factories were prime targets for Allied bombing campaigns, and the factories quickly became ensnared in a vicious bomb-rebuild-bomb cycle that didn't stop until the end of the war when Germany ran out of materials needed to keep them going. Bomb-rebuild-bomb is like Aesop Rock album or something. Bomb-rebuild-bomb. Bomb-rebuild-bomb. Bomb, rebuild, bomb. <laughs> 
None shall pass. Uh, by the war's end in May of 1945, most Mercedes factories had been completely leveled, as were most German cities. The directors of the company believed the brand itself to be dead and declared that the mark had ceased to exist. Mercedes, like the rest of Germany, was now tasked with reconciling with the past, rebuilding, and finding a new path forward. Mercedes would begin its rebuilding process in 1946 in Stuttgart, when the American occupation forces allowed them to begin rebuilding their assembly lines. Over the next few years, this process would play out across much of Germany as its economy slowly came back to life. Mercedes found most of its early post-war successes building the 1930s-era 170DA diesel, which had an efficient engine valued in a society still rationing fuel. But Mercedes wouldn't resign itself to building outdated diesels for long. Leadership had begun to believe recovery was possible and set their sights on returning the brand to prominence. They not only wanted to modernize, but to once again set the benchmark for the entire automotive industry. So, to do so, they would lean on their now 60-plus years of automotive experience, their traditions in luxury and performance, and their success at the racetrack. And perhaps the individual most important to this ambitious project was one Rudolf Uhlenhaut. Can't you run diesel engines off of, like, kerosene and other fuels? Uh-huh. When we did the Mr. Beast uh, video, um, the jet car ran on, uh, it was like jet fuel, which is like a kerosene kind of, or it ran on kerosene. Uh, and we were running super low on gas, yeah. towing the car out there from Chicago. Because it was to, leaking, right? That's another thing. Uh, the truck itself, we were running very low on fuel, yeah. and we're in the middle of Pennsylvania in the middle of the night somewhere. We were driving from Chicago to North Carolina. The gas station was closed, so we had to open up the jet car and take the jet fuel out of the car, which had sloshed everywhere, by the way, and put it into our truck, and that's how we got to the next gas station. Wow. So, yeah, they're very resilient engines. They can run on junk. You know, Chicken uh, mouse fat. piss. Yeah, mouse piss. <laughs> yeah. Not, I mean, mouse piss is hard to get. Yeah. So. Not if you're me. Not if you're Nolan. King I'm Mouse. A, mouse I King. I give you that I'm piss. a mouse, Greg. Can you piss me? <laughs> I'm a mouse, Greg. Can you piss me, Greg? Bye. <laughs> Rudolph Rudy Olin Hout was born in London on July 15th, 1906, to a German father and an English mother. In his mid-20s, Rudolph attended Munich Technical Institute, MTI, where my MTI people at, where he graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering in 1931. That same year, he secured a job at Daimler-Benz as a passenger car test engineer. They're like, <laughs> you're going to get in here. We're going to run you into a wall. Yeah. I was about to say. I thought he was like a passenger in the test car. Like, all guys <laughs> yeah, testing it. And that would just... be a test car passenger <laughs> engineer, <laughs> okay. not a passenger car test engineer. Yeah, syntax is key. I assume that this guy drove cars around. Passenger oh. car test engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he a probably test car driver of yeah, yeah. sorts. Maybe not a driver, but he like talks to the driver and the driver's like, it feels kinda squishy it around feels this turn. Squishy around this tan. And yeah. he's like, All right, crack, 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 now. crack. <laughs> it didn't take long for Rudolph to make a name for himself. His co workers and supervisors were continually impressed by his creativity in solving engineering problems, and his easygoing disposition made him nice to be around. He'd also earned a name for himself as a motorcyclist and was said to have lapped the Nürburgring hundreds of times. By 1936, 30-year-old Rudy was the obvious choice to take over the now-struggling factory racing team mentioned in previous Passcast episodes, a team that received financial incentives from the Nazi regime to promote their ideals of German superiority in motorsport. This guy kind of sounds like Jeremiah. He's an engineer. He rides motorcycles. He works for the Nazis. Easy to be around. <laughs> yeah. Rudolph quickly turned the team around. In addition to his engineering skills, he made equally important contributions as a test driver. So, turns out, he was a test driver, driving the cars around. Yeah. During the development of the W125 GP car, he took the prototype onto the Nürburgring to diagnose problems and often cloaked times as fast as or faster than the team drivers. That's embarrassing for those guys. Yeah. Like, yeah. Here's the thing. He knows how to do a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Those guys. That's all they do. That's all they do. It's like when uh, Jeremiah gets a faster lap than Adam. Mm -hmm. and, and Adam's yeah, like, it's Ooh. So I guess I'll just go chill. <laughs> I guess I'll just go chill. 
When the Silver Arrow returned to the track for the 1937 season, it was evident that they had the car to beat. And under Rudolph's leadership, the team won back-to-back championships in 1937 and 1938. After the war cut the 1939 season short, Rudolph was reassigned to the factory floor to assemble aircraft engines and, as a dual British-German citizen, was put under surveillance by the Gestapo. Hmm. One of my favorite cold soups. Marjorie Taylor (laughs) Greene. It's unclear what became of Rudolph in the years immediately following the war, but his already storied career began anew when he was asked to return to Mercedes as head of research and development in the late 1940s. After the board decided to build a new racing program to help return the marquee to its cutting edge image. Little could he, his engineering team, or the board have imagined that he would create a car that would come to symbolize the brand well into the 21st century. Uh, (laughs) Yes, and basically, we know what he did before World War II. Yeah. And then we don't know what he did. (laughs) And Curious. then right after World War II, we know what he did again. Curious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That happened a lot. Yeah, this didn't take very good records. Yeah. The, especially the the Nazis, uh, very uh, well known for not keeping good records. Yeah, yeah. the Nazis were bad at lists. Yeah. It was probably just like a gap year or something. Yeah, it's not like the Nazis were like obsessed with knowing where no. people were. No. <laughs> they were terrible with that. The Gestapo just lost track of him for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. We don't know. People were watching him and then we won't. We watch. don't know. Are we supposed to find him? I know him he was probably doing good things. Rudolph was the obvious choice for a Mercedes that believed itself to be dead a few years prior, and his out-of-the-box and creative engineering would prove invaluable to a cash-strapped company that needed to make more than a decade's worth of development in just a few years. With a low budget and no recent developments or program to build upon, his team set to work. The decision was made to use the Type 300 luxury sedan parts bin as a base. The team began by extracting an extra 55 horsepower from the 115 horsepower 3 liter inline That's 6. That's huge. I know, it's a huge increase, yeah. Without increasing displacement or using forced induction. But the team needed more than extra power, and certainly more could be gained by modifications to other Type 300 parts. I didn't know that that was an inline 6. It's weird that I went this long. I thought it was a V8. There. There's a lot of cars I'm just saying. I don't know what's under there. Yeah. I just like how it looks. I uh, like how it looks. Yeah. Rudolph's solution was to completely redesign the frame and bodywork to make the car lighter, stronger, and more aerodynamic. The end result was nothing short of revolutionary. The multi-tube space frame the team created weighed less than 200 pounds. And what? The, yeah, and the body had a drag coefficient of 0.25, a number difficult to achieve even today. Yeah, just for context, the... Model S is the most aerodynamic car it's like in production 2, today, and yeah. it's 0.22. 0.22, wow. Yeah, so yeah. this is just a couple Very hundreds close. off. That's crazy. Wow. The design wasn't without its quirks, though. The frame created a high sill around the passenger compartment and made traditional doors impossible to fit to the car. The solution was to fit hinges to the roof and install a door that lifted up rather than out, allowing the driver and passenger to climb down into the car. Like a bat. Like a bat. Like a bat. The lightweight race car born from the Type 300 parts bin and Rudolph's ingenuity was dubbed the 300 SL. Noise. SL standing for... Serlite. Which roughly translates to... Lightweight. When it was unveiled on March 2nd, 1952, the automotive press noted its unique door design, quote, looked like the wings of a gull, and thus the nickname Gullwing was born. Oh, a gull, man. if you don't know, is a bird. <laughs> it's like a bat. It's like a bat with feathers on it. A yeah. bird. Which is why they commonly call gulls bat of the day. <laughs> yeah, sea bat. <laughs> the 300 SL's second place finish during its first outing at the 1952 Mille Miglia was a sign of success to come. The Gullwing often commanded the front of the pack, Finishing one, two, three, four at the Nurburgring. One, two, three, four. <laughs> one, two, three at the Grand Prix of Bern. One, Bert. two, three. And one, two. One, two. At Le Mans and the Carrera Panamericana in 1952. Op just hit the ground running. Hit the ground driving. This is one of my favorite cars, I think. I uh, know. Jay Leno has one in his collection, and it's not perfect. It's no. like perfectly patinaed. It's the so paint's nice. all kind of cracked It's and my stuff. favorite. Yeah. It's my favorite one. It's my favorite car, I think, in his collection. Yeah. Despite its impressive success in motorsport, Mercedes withdrew the 300 SL from racing after a single year. 
and decided to take the 1953 season off to prepare for a re-entry into Grand Prix racing, a storied series which had recently changed its name to Formula One. Mm. Rudolph took the helm once again. With knowledge he acquired from building aircraft engines during the war, he fitted the F1 regulation 2.5 liter straight eight with direct fuel injection and developed magnesium alloy bodywork for the chassis. Dang, a straight eight? Mm -hmm. 2.5 liter straight eight is insane. I mean, that sounds sick. Yeah. Now we've gone, in the previous episode, we are mm -hmm. big displacement, few cylinders. We're like, what, like 5.7 liter four cylinders? There's a stuff. 10 liter. There's a 10 liter four cylinder. And now lots of cylinders, small displacement. So. Well, the Beast of Turin was like 25 liter inline four. God. <laughs> Bless That's it. That's insane. God. That is a beast. Bless it. <laughs> As he had as team boss in the late 1930s, he tested the car himself on the Nürburgring and would later best new team driver and F1 world champion Juan Manuel Fangio's time around Nordschleife. Nice. The result was the W196 Streamliners. This thing. This is a speed racer car. Yeah, man, this thing's pretty freaking good looking. <laughs> and the seat's plaid. <laughs> The fenders have oh. eyebrows. Yeah, to, as if to go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love the exhaust coming out of the side. Yeah, this is really cool. I like this thing. I think cars are cool. Cars are cool. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> when they arrived at the 1954 French GP on July 4th, it was the first time Mercedes had entered a Grand Prix in 15 years. But we don't know what they were doing between <laughs> 1940 and 1940. Probably just chilling, though. Yeah. <laughs> when the checkered flag was waved, Mercedes drivers Juan Manuel Fangio and Carl Kling took first and second place. Nice. Between 1954 and 55, Fangio won 11 of 14 races in the W196 and took home two world championships. One of those was the Carrera Panamericana, and they were like the car to beat for a number of years. Uh, we talked about it mm -hmm. in our uh, Phil Hill episode, if you want to go check that out. Formula One wasn't the only racing series in which Mercedes was having success. In 1955, Mercedes entered the World Sports Car Championship with the 300 SLR, a car more futuristic than Mercedes could have even hoped for from Rudolph's team. It's like a pointier SL Yeah, with the side exit exhaust. That's so cool. You don't want to get out of that car with a short skirt. That thing's sick. Noted. Thank you, Joey. Thank you. I <laughs> you ever have the chance to drive in that car? Don't wear a short skirt. <laughs> okay, I will change. <laughs> Developed from the 196 platform, the SLR had a 310 horsepower, 3 liter straight 8 engine, and an open cockpit body made of sheet magnesium. Ooh. Wow. With lines reminiscent of the 300 SL. The car could slow down rapidly from its 185 mile per hour top speeds thanks to a hydraulic air brake similar to those found on cars what? like the Bugatti Veyron. Whoa. That's active aero? Yeah. Driver Sterling Moss would later describe the SLR as the greatest sports car ever built. Despite a late entry in the 1955 season, it was so successful that the Mercedes team managed to walk away with the championship. Perhaps the most impressive performance came at Millimiglia. Sterling Moss and co-driver Dennis Jenkinson broke the race time record and clocked in at an average speed of 97.96 miles per hour, That's almost sketchy. 10 miles per hour higher than the previous record holder. That's like the roads are still cobblestone at that point. <laughs> yeah, and dirt. Yeah. The Moss and Jenkinson team had created a form of pace notes by mapping the entire course on an 18-foot roll That's of paper sick. where they graded corners using terms like saucy and dodgy, I love that. <laughs> which were then relayed to Moss via hand signals while driving. If you wrote that into a script, I'd be like, that's too... It's too cool. Too cool. Too cool. Tone it down a little bit. Tone it down a little bit. Make How it do more you believable. tell Sterling Moss that a corner is saucy with a hand motion? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> He's like, oh, saucy. Like yeah. <laughs> and you smell it. You're like, oh, I hate ketchup on my fingers. Ketchup you know? on my fingers. Stinky, stinky. What What's dodgy, hell? though? How you dodgy? <laughs> <laughs> Big thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. There's been many a time when I was just uncertain about my future 
Sometimes in life we're faced with tough choices and the path forward isn't always clear. No one's gonna give you a playbook for how to live life. You have to figure it out yourself and it's confusing a lot. Whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships, or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life. So you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Honestly, you gotta start living life for yourself. Don't worry about what other people think of you or what your parents want for you. I didn't really know that until I started taking therapy, and I think the best way to get into therapy is BetterHelp. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you gotta do is just fill out a brief questionnaire and, and you get matched with a therapist. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash passgas today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash passgas. Thank you, BetterHelp. But Mercedes's dominant run was about to come to an abrupt and tragic end. On June 11, 1955, at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, Mercedes driver Pierre Levey crashed into the back of another car that had accidentally cut him off near the pit lane. Levey's SLR careened off the track over a berm and began to disintegrate as it tumbled across the spectator area. The magnesium alloy body caught fire almost immediately and flaming debris was scattered in nearly every direction. In the end, LeVay and 82 spectators died, and fire crews struggled for hours to extinguish the blaze. The remaining races of the championship calendar were canceled, and Mercedes later announced that it was withdrawing from racing. To this day, it remains the worst accident in motor racing history. This, is, uh, this was a big big yeah. moment for yeah. motorsports a lot of manufacturers pull out mm -hmm. of professional racing altogether a lot of the american uh manufacturers banned yeah they didn't professional want racing. like they didn't want the corvette to go into production because uh -huh. they you know because promoted motorsport yeah i mean but this was like deal. the culmination of a lot of years of a lot of death yes. leading up to it and like every time a ferrari driver would die the pope and like the italian government and the european governments would come out and say like racing you got to stop doing this like it's it's too much yeah what's different about this is that 82 spectators just yeah. chilling yeah oh that i mean that footage is just terrible yeah it's real bad all this momentum towards like racing bands and like making it safer culminated with this horrible accident and it it helped the cause and made racing yeah. safer after this and yeah made people like rethink uh, track design and stuff like that. Hey, maybe we shouldn't have hay bales as like the barriers on the side of racetracks. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> should we put the grandstands right next to the track or maybe put them back a little bit? We should get rid of those, uh, the spinning saw blades <laughs> that go across the road <laughs> intermittently. I think that they shouldn't uh, be able to throw turtle shells at each other. <laughs> so maybe we don't let a giant gorilla drive. <laughs> After the cancellation of the racing program, Rudolph, now 49 years old, became chief engineer of passenger car development, and Mercedes became singularly focused on finding the right kind of success in sales that Rudolph and his team had brought them at the track. He had started down this path a few years prior by convincing the Mercedes board to allocate funds to produce a road-going version of the 300 SL race car that had become known for its racing success. The car that was launched to the public in 1954 bore the same name as its race car predecessor and managed to live up to its namesake. Like the race car, it retained its fuel injection system, a first for a production wow. car. Wow, whoa. Yeah. And its iconic gullwing doors. To offset a weight gain from its new steel body and interior trim, the engine was tuned to make 40 horsepower more than the racing version. So this makes like 340 horsepower? That's nuts that's for 1954. That is, that's nutty, dude. Hey, Corvette who? Corvette. Yeah. Sorry, new phone. More Who like dis? Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, dude. More like Cor, get the hell out of my face, you slow. <laughs> <laughs> the end product was so faithful to the racing design that the FIA considered it to be suitable for competition in the Gran Turismo class. The production cars were successful in a number of races and rallies, including the Mille Miglia and the Tour de France Automobile. And it is often recognized. Automobile. Automobile. And it is often recognized today as the first supercar. You know, I heard Sterling Moss called it the best sports car of all time. That was the SLR. <laughs> <laughs> the price is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Since the early 1950s, other departments at Mercedes had been taking the technological advancements from Rudolph's development team and marrying them with what the brand knew best 
luxury. Dude, oh, at uh, Bruce Meyer. At Bruce Meyer's lair. <laughs> his lair? His, I was going to call it a lair. I would call it a lair. He's, yeah. he's like a, you know, yeah. a very wealthy man. He's got a car man, elevator. That's a lair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he has like a beautiful silver uh, SL mm-hmm. with like red leather interior uh. and the matching luggage that goes in the back window. It's like. In 1952, Mercedes launched a new Type 300, which was lauded as the pinnacle of automotive design, outclassing even Rolls-Royce and custom coach builders. This guy. Guys, this is seven years after the end of World War II. Yeah. It looks like if Winston Churchill was or, a car. This is five years after the end of World War II. In 1955, the Type 300S received fuel injection thanks to Rudy's development team. It was as fast as it was luxurious and could reach speeds up to 109 miles per hour, making it one of the fastest cars of the era. The 300 was a resounding success in the upper echelons of society and was not only popular in Hollywood, but with diplomats and royalty as well. Oh, ooh, that is a nice looking little car there. All right, keep it I in like your pants. It. No. Oh, no. <laughs> that it's, it's is an... Winston Churchill as a car. <laughs> no, Winston Churchill would hate this car. He hated the Nazis. In addition to the Type 300, Mercedes Winston Churchill's launched... a Rolls. Rolls Royce. A Rolls but Royce and Bulldogs kind of I'm talking guy. about like if you were to put in AI, mm-hmm. I want a car that looks like Winston Churchill's head and face. That would come up. <laughs> in addition to the Type 300, Mercedes launched the Type 180, the predecessor to today's S Class, in 1953. In 1955, the 190SL followed, establishing mm-hmm. a lineup of vehicles similar to any modern Mercedes. Uh, oh, yeah. Customer it's got SL. eyebrows, too. Yeah. Dude, it if your Fenders don't have eyebrows, what are you even doing? Uh, you doing probably eating at freaking s- Country Town Buffet. <laughs> Country just, town. Just country a, town. Yeah. I'm a little country, but I'm a little town. <laughs> country town. Yeah, we might be country, but we got a mayor and a post office. <laughs> country town buffet. Country town. Just shoveling <laughs> slop in your mouth at country town buffet. Buffet. With no eyebrows on your car. <laughs> country town buffet. Welcome. Much of Mercedes' design philosophy of the late 50s, as well as its financial recovery, can be attributed to the export market, especially in the U.S. Because the U.S. escaped World War II with its home front pretty much unscathed, yeah. Americans had tons of money to spend. So, yeah. Oh, and also, now we owned the world. Yeah, too. we had more than 50% of the world's wealth at yeah. this point. We're just, just like, pretty hey, sweet. sorry, we bombed everything, fellas. Pretty sweet circumstances. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they had tons of money. Mercedes established Daimler-Benz of North America. In 1955. Good move, honestly. Good move. Great move. Good move. In retrospect, <laughs> at the time, yeah, I was like, like good I, move. I don't know about Respect. this, but now, Respect. pretty hey, cool. Real recognize real. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Good stuff. <laughs> when it came time to replace the Gullwing, Rudy's design team had the American market in mind. The resulting 300 SL Roadster had more luggage space, was more comfortable, it was better ventilated, and easier to enter. Suspension revisions made the handling better and more predictable. The car gained 200 pounds in the process. Mm, Sounds like me on quarantine. But it was even (laughs) faster than before thanks to its more powerful engine. A mere 14 years after the brand was essentially declared dead, Mercedes was once again setting the industry standards. Sales flourished, its cars had captivated the global elite, and its brief return to racing showed that the company who did it first could still do it best. Mm. 300 SL, that's a good looking car too. Yeah. Do you think that Mercedes was like allowed to, because it, dude, it's seven years mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. we were at war, the biggest war in the world, twice yeah. with this like national German car company. Do you think the fact that a Rothschild was one of their first customers ever had anything to do with like them being um, like, you know what? Let's let them. Go. Let, let them cook. Let them cook. I mean, yeah. so many people who are complicit in the Holocaust were essentially let off the hook for various reasons. I mean, Werner von Braun, yeah. not necessarily involved in the Holocaust, but Germany's top, you know, rocketry engineer. We brought yeah. him over here to work Project for NASA. Paper, paperclip. Project Paperclip. Operation, Operation Paperclip. Lots of uh, very educated Nazis were uh, exported around the world to work for I mean, the Allied like Mer- governments. There's got to be stuff that was allowed to happen and influences 
happening that allowed Mercedes to be like awesome very totally. quickly. Yeah. I mean, Rudy, uh, there's a there's a portion of his <laughs> yeah. biography missing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we don't know what he was doing. We don't know what he's doing. Like there's a lot of people who we don't know what they're doing. Um, I did and, think it was weird when Werner von Braun had to insist on like measuring the skulls of all the <laughs> astronauts. <laughs> we have to make sure the helmets fit. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot make helmets in different sizes. <laughs> Rudy was promoted from chief engineer to head of passenger car development in 1959. With his help, Mercedes would continue to refine its image as a luxury and sports car maker in the 1960s and early 70s. And no two cars symbolize this refinement more than the 230 SL and the 600. Ooh. Is, oh, this yeah. the fa- is this the red pig car? Dude, the 230 SL, ultimate, ultimate hot girl car. Ultimate hot girl car. Ultimate hot girl car. We had, uh, I think Byron drove one of these for Miracle Whips. Mm-hmm. I'm fairly yeah. certain. And he was like, that not is so for me, cute. but ultimate hot girl car. They got rid of the eyebrows, though. Yeah, no eyebrows. Got to go to a country time buffet. <laughs> Enjoy our eyebrow oatmeal. Eyebrow oatmeal. <laughs> the development of the 230 SL came out of Rudy's first assignment in his new position. To develop the accessible and beloved 190 SL Sports Coupe and Cabriolet and the untouchable 300 SL Supercar and combine them into a single car. Like a turducken of a car. <laughs> The resulting 230SL combined the performance and luxury-oriented nature of the 300 and the affordability and manufacturing ease of the 190. But when it was unveiled to the public in 1963, the automotive press was deflated. As a success to the Goldwing and the Roadster, it's possible nothing could have lived up to the hype. The car also had the misfortune of debuting the same year as Jaguar's oh. legendary E-Type and the C2 Corvette Stingray. Wah, wah. Critics derided the 230SL squared off body, a stark departure from the once curvy design, and its 2.3 liter inline six, which made a meager 150 hertzpers. <laughs> but when the press were able to get behind the wheel, <laughs> opinions changed. Oh, whoops, I'll ta- I take that fart back. <laughs> <laughs> Testers noted that not only had the transmission and brakes improved over its predecessor, but its handling and comfort had too, and even eclipsed its rivals at Jaguar and Chevrolet. Oh. God damn it. To further prove the car's My metal, bad. if I'm told to pick a car for like long, lots of miles, yeah. and it's going to stay relevant and cool looking for a long time, I'm given the choice of a Jaguar, Chevrolet, or Mercedes. I mean... I got nipples too, Greg. You can milk me. I'm taking the Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> to further prove the car's metal, it was entered into the Spa Sofia Liege rally, where it took, gentlemen, any guesses? First, First place. Oh, man. The car continued to be the darling of the automotive press throughout the decade. Of the 1967 <laughs> model, sports car graphics said the car would be easy to summarize as faultless. Car and driver wrote, every driver who has more than a purely utilitarian interest in automobiles should drive it. (laughs) Okay. As a successor to the Gullwing and Roadster, it's possible nothing could have lived up to the hype. And perhaps most complimentary to Rudy's design and indicative of the Mercedes brand, Road and Track wrote, for those who value engineering finesse and high quality construction, it is alone in the field. Nice. Mm Mm-hmm. The Mercedes 600 was also unveiled in 1963. When it hit the market a year later, it did as much to honor the brand's history as it did to establish its future. Following in the footsteps of the Type 300, it was the pinnacle of luxury and the benchmark for other luxury brands. Rudy knew the importance of the car to the brand and once said that the cost of building it was of secondary importance. Just make it. Don't care what it costs. Dennis Adler notes in his book, Daimler and Benz, The Complete History, that Rudy and his team spared no expense, focusing on maximizing interior space, silent operation, fine materials, build quality, climate control, and power assistance for all manual operations. The 600 also could be custom ordered, and nearly every customization request was approved 
for its elite clientele. That's pretty early. Yeah, you want an alligator in the back, we'll get you one. (laughs) We will find a way. The car was so advanced for its time that new owners were recommended to take a training course (laughs) that covered all the operations of the vehicle. Dude, I tried to rent uh, like a classic car on Haggerty a while ago for Uh one of our shoots, and the owner was like, all right, I'll rent this to you, but I'm going to have to drive around with you for 30 minutes too. And it was just like a 90s car. It's not like you have to like pull levers. What was it? I want to say like an old Camaro or something like that. But I was like, Did he keep putting his hand on your leg? (laughs) <laughs> he's like oops i thought that was a shifter yeah maybe like, he just wanted to hang out yeah you know? 25 minutes uh, tr- left seriously though like the car rental like the private car rental stuff is so extra now it's, it's, so it's extra. like it's like an airbnb kind of mentality to some of these some of these owners yeah. it's like listen pal if you weren't broke i wouldn't be able to rent your f- car oh you know what it was it was a pontiac g8 <laughs> from uh, 2006 come on Oh, well, he probably want to make sure that you wouldn't go take it to uh, a takeover or something. But it's not like I'm, I'm not going to let him know in 30 minutes that yeah. I'm going to take it to a takeover. Yeah. I'm going to wait until <laughs> I drop him off. So how good do you think this thing would spin? <laughs> <laughs> the 600 also set Mercedes on a path that it would be known for today. Fast luxury sedans. In 1968, the 600 SEL gave customers the option to fit their 600 with a 6.3 liter V8 that could propel the car to 138 miles per hour. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Making it the world's fastest four-door and the world's first sports Ooh, sedan. I can't wait to talk about Big that. fan of these. Don't they have like a six liter, 6.3 liter V8? Isn't that what they put in like the 63s? They used to. Now it's uh, like the the top luxury sedan has like a turbocharged four liter uh hybrid system oh, it still wow. makes like 600 horsepower or whatever Jeez. but yeah it's not a v8 anymore by the time rudy retired in 1972 at age 66 he had undeniably helped establish the mercedes we know today his contributions can't be understated he revived the racing development team on a shoestring budget and created a masterpiece the 300 sl gullwing and went on to develop two of the most important cars for establishing the modern Mercedes brand. He was equally known for his abilities as an engineer and a test driver. The Washington Post wrote in his 1989 obituary that, quote, A friend once described him as being able to stare the laws of physics straight in the eye and force them to back down. I love that. (laughs) And that he was the sort of genius who could go from arguing the theory of a camshaft design one minute, grabbing a wrench and adjusting the valves the next, then putting the engine through its paces on the racetrack, the next. Even Sterling Moss said Rudy was, quote, among the greatest drivers in the history of sport. That's Holy all that crap. Sterling Moss says is this is the greatest. This is so in good. The That's the best. He's pretty hyperbolic. Yeah. It's the best. But he's earned it. It's okay. Yeah. Has he? Sterling Moss? <laughs> yeah. Is he good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a few years before Rudy's retirement, a new generation was stepping forward. Two Mercedes engineers were hard at work on a racing engine for the 300 SE sedan. When Mercedes scuttled the racing program once again, the two decided to go it alone and left to form their own company. Oh, yeah. They would stick with Mercedes cars and help pioneer yeah. the concept of a tuning house, uh-huh. bringing racing and high-performance prestige to the brand from the outside. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mercedes would take notice. And its forward-thinking trajectory would put it on a collision course with a successful duo. Together, they would go racing once again, develop a number of supercars, and the Mercedes brand would boldly charge into the 21st century. We're talking AMG. AMG. Nice. That's where we'll pick up next week with the fourth and final episode in our four-part series about the history of Mercedes. I tell you what, guys, I'm having a blast going through this. It's one of the coolest car companies ever. It's rare that a company has like multiple visionary executives that mm-hmm. help propel it forward. This is like, you could tell this is like what Henry Ford wanted with Ford, <laughs> with yeah. his son, and then it just didn't pan out. Yeah, because you know? he was too busy eating weeds outside of his mansion. Oh, the milkweed's coming in nice this <laughs> August. <laughs> but yeah, make sure you tune in next week. We got the final edition of our four-part series on mercedes i can't wait to see how it wraps yeah. up we'll see how we get to the metallica black version <laughs> yeah, of nice. the- yeah oh yeah <laughs> this is all leading up to the metallica 
black version. We're gonna end the episode with our Doug Doug Demon might make an appearance oh, at the end of the fingers episode. Fingers crossed. Yeah, hopefully. All right, listener mail. We got a, that's a message. We got some mail from our listeners. Today it's from Juan. Hey guys, my name is Juan Serrano, a student from Central Washington University in Washington State. I wanted to start this email by saying thank you. The pandemic was one of the most stressful times of likely all of our lives, definitely for me. But then I discovered Donut Media. You all reignited a passion for cars that I haven't felt since I was a kid. Your podcast has helped me throughout my daily two-hour commutes to and from school. And unbeknownst to you all, you've all been my favorite passengers from undergrad up to my final year of graduate school. Wow, congrats, Juan. Thank you for your amazing content, being amazing people, and being a light through the dark. I probably wouldn't have gotten as far as I did without your support. Wow, that's very nice. Now my question for you all is this. What is a semi-affordable, fun but practical car that you would consider buying if you could? Once I graduate, I'll finally be making grown-up money, and I'm kind of in a pickle. The two choices I have right now are a Genesis G70 because of its peppy 3.3 liter V6 twin turbo engine, drift mode capabilities, beautiful design, and comfortable interior driving dynamics. The other choice I've been thinking about is the Mustang Mach-E. It has decent range, Mm -hmm. a controversial but beautiful body style. It's fun compared to other EVs in its price range, and it has lots of practical capabilities. I know they are two different cars with different driving philosophies, but maybe y'all could help me decide. Feel free to throw in your thoughts or suggestions as well. Stay safe, keep it juiced, and James, I hope you find your son. Nice. (laughs) Thank you, Juan. Juan. Nolan, you want to take this? Yeah, Nolan, why don't you take this? Sure. I've heard a lot of good things about the G70. Um... I do know that dealing with Hyundai and Genesis dealers can be kind of yeah. annoying sometimes. Um, Ford Mach-E, I mean, I think if they didn't call it a Mustang, people would have a lot different opinions of it. I think it's a pretty good car. It's yeah. very fast. We rented one for a shoot a while ago. Yeah. It's insanely fast. I probably wouldn't buy, like, the first electric car that Mustang or that Ford puts out. I think they're running into a lot of, like, issues with the battery and the electronics of it right now but in terms of practicality like you like the Mach-E like I I think sticking with something with like a hatchback design is probably the best route especially it sounds like you want to be able to like carry a lot of stuff um what makes you think that yeah what like books that well no because the the spectrum that we're choosing from is like a a a grown-up sporty sedan or a EV hatch so it's not looking for he's not looking for like a track car maybe he's planning on having kids at some point yeah yeah. So I think so, like keeping something with cargo space, but I don't know. Sounds like he wants a grown up car. A grown up car. Hatchbacks yeah. aren't grown up. Not like hot hatch. I'm saying something with a hatchback. Maybe like yeah. a stinger. Maybe a stinger is. I will say when we had a stinger a couple years ago and I was driving it to and from work, I was like, I feel like a grown up in this mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. We had a producer here who had a stinger. He loved that thing. Maybe a Q50 or like a Q60. Mm-hmm. Audi RS5 or <laughs> F80 M3. That's what I would do. Yeah. I was going to uh, suggest an Audi, but I thought you guys would call me a homer. No. Audi RS5 or F80 M3 is what I would do. If I was you. If I were you. <laughs> Who can relate? What are you thinking so hard about? I'm trying to give an honest. Uh, well, we're uh, almost done with okay, this. Okay, take a look at Volvo Wagons. Ugh, God. <laughs> Sophisticated, wow. grown up, Way to fun to drive. Drop the ball and pressure us <laughs> on. Thank you guys so much for listening to this. Uh, we will see you next week to wrap up this series. Follow Nolan on social media at Thank Nolan you. J Sykes. Follow Joe at Joe G Weber. Follow me at James Pumphrey or on TikTok. I uh, the Kentucky Cobra. Uh, if you want some donut merch, including the Wink Wink Nation shirt, go to donutmedia.com or check out your local Zoomies anywhere in North America. <laughs> <laughs> or a blue tomato in Europe. Uh, I we say our social handles every week, and I don't think anyone. Does. Yeah. You know what's got me the biggest bump is being on that broadcast channel. Yeah, check yeah. out our. You can join our broadcast channel on Instagram. You won't be able to comment, but we can. You can get a little backdoor. Yeah, lots of, of backdoor donut. action with all the guys <laughs> from Donut. We post our dump trucks pretty often. Yep. yep. Bye.